my mind didn't want to go here to explore the words that would define this moment. Facing our loss of Larry and Larry's loss, I trusted that words would be discovered somewhere among those previously formed on other occasions, by myself or perhaps by Larry, or shaped out of accidentally recovered but relevant moments that we shared. There wasn't an easy way out. For sure, there are plenty of memories, none as profound as some Larry shared, though, with other, from other niches of his life, like thrilling car races, as he had experience with his cousin and his uncle, none that mark his most horrible days, uh, his most horrible days of one of the worst wars of the many in which the U.S. chose to be involved in the 20th century. No, just small ones between us. Vivid and precious, though, like maybe the first of yours with your family member that helped shape, shape your life. And far fewer, like that of an older brother, who you only discover very late that you had. Just a few here and there. Not enough. All in peril of being forgotten, especially when the loved one has slipped away. But here are a few. Of the startlingly, startlingly, hard word, startlingly dashing collector, but something far more. His would be a dictionary-defying term, as far to the opposite end of the spectrum from the effete art connoisseur as can be, whose amazingly crafted building artifacts gave meat and bones to Larry Lowick's exhibit a long time ago. In this exhibit, based on the second Larry's seminal eponymous book about St. Louis's architectural heritage, are Larry's most common objects shown like gems. And then some horrifyingly of those objects, some horrifyingly, horrifyingly fell off the wall one night when no one was looking. Why weren't the L brackets installed to brace the exhibit case deck and its backboard? But he didn't flap, he was unflappable. Here was the most meaningfully, honestly, openly pleasant person because everything is fleeting, especially money. Impossible in that rarefied world of museums. Someone to be grateful for meeting, even if only once. A little later, of the suave, pencil mustachioed shadow who became Catherine's beau. Regularly seeing the museum's curator, he became a casual visitor, a friend, quiet, unassuming, forthright. There when you needed him, you had to find him first, but mostly you could always figure out where to look. After their pairing commitment was over, Larry quietly edged into a unique status where he seemed to prove that the center is held, if only by a force that seems to come from outside the maelstrom of monkey mind life personally salving, salvaging building parts as the fabric of the city was torn away to be rebuilt in modernist anonymity, he was both outside and deeply, deeply understanding of what needs to matter for the material core of civilization, its built environment. Which for a lot of people is just about everything they know, whether they understand it or not. As a boots on the ground St. Louis and native, he understood parts of the inside in ways that insiders can't. He shared glimpses of what could be seen about the hows and whys of our built community from his inside out promontory through his twinkling ice blue eyes, brightening during a party's marginal conversation to an unexpected opportunity for advancing meaning, or over a casual momentary sighting anywhere of a parapet of the remains of a sillstone or in a parking lot for an afterthought just before parting company for who knows how long. Often he rocked up onto the balls of his feet and back to his heels, a slight smile blooming carefully, chosen descriptors, through chosen descriptors, imparting facts about craft, labor, and the builder's impulses that otherwise seem lost to time. Context, sweeping and profound connections about history, materiality, and craft. Plenty of conversational pauses were always available for mutual reflection, reciprocal additions, for joint construction of insight. 
and infectious excitement of it all. If you were up to the challenge of appreciating the reality of your built environment, which, as, I, as was said, is a context that we should, should, should just about be uh, there for everybody who's an urban dweller, right? Of simple, also, even Spartan meals with Larry enjoyed so much when with company. His inquisitiveness and skepticism flowing through conversation that revealed a labor and built environment perspective comparable to his, this library's vastness. Of a library who suffered no fools, who lack appreciation and interest, he measured words carefully and calmly when reflecting on how typically today's large museums are the expression of liberal arts bureaucrats who, how they dither about soundbite history, refuse to challenge, miss meaning as they produce dumbed-down messages and pander to popular taste. This is hard for a museum professional to hear, but it was not intended harshly to the company. He spoke harshly of the freakatorium, knew that people deserve more than an entertainment venue to bring them out of their alienation, to appreciate even treasure, work, method, and process, and the trades, and understand place. Somewhere locked away in electrons yet to be sorted, there is an interview. My memory of that day might be brighter than reality, but most valuable of all of its parts is the visual. Us, amidst the dark brown grime of the foundry floor here, in the process of conversion, the uneven dirt and concrete hit by shafts of golden light rupturing through the broken roof, bathing stool-seated Larry Giles in his ubiquitous button-down Oxford shirt, maybe not rumpled this time. As he expounded upon regional origins of building construction, resources, and the processes that refined them. Surrounding and well off camera, locked away in crates or piled on sleepers in the outer yards, <clears throat> were the encyclopedic examples of his collection. Certainly, this is but one of several interviews that Larry generously and patiently provided for the curious, helping others to establish a record of understanding. And there were the many out of the blue, considerate, and remarkably helpful emails and phone calls, the nudges toward one research issue or collecting resource or another. And there is the missed two-minute final phone message, a treasure of understatement about unfolding dire circumstances and the hope, promise really, of future progress at the foundry. See you later, buddy. As he would say. It's easy to get stuck at the surface of the materiality of all this. Larry's work, his amassing of the iron, terracotta, stone, wood, and plaster, his re-engineering and reconstruction of a campus of edifices is extremely material. That pneumatic equipment is required to move parts of this collection. That engines and fire, mining, milling, chemistry, catalyst, carving, and casting formed and constructed these elements first and subsequent purposes is profoundly material. Larry's work reveals much of that in ways no one has previously accomplished. This is national, even international treasure here. But the greatest gift someone can give is not merely to reveal something, rather it is to enable others to reveal for themselves. How have we built this world that houses our bodies and our actions? How do these structures embody not just our material culture, but our social concerns, the economics that drive inequities and focuses passions and abilities? How do we know what are the witness marks of our history for each of us? Where is our daily craft? Most important of all, how do we devote ourselves to excellence and shouldn't we? This is what is greatest, into the meaning and at the heart of what matters in Larry's gift to us. May we carry his vision for the National Building Arts Center forward with that in mind. Thanks.